Tonight's gonna look a little bit different than the first night. I know that um, a lot of you are repeats uh, from our first uh, session from, from part one, but I also recognize that some of you might not have been able to, to partake in the first uh, time that we were together. And so I'm gonna go over uh, a little bit, recap and um, revisit some of the things that we learned last time, and then teach one of the main uh, CRIM skills uh, that I think is one of the most impactful ones and one of the ones that I use on a daily basis um, that can be really fun to use as well. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that one. And then that's, that's the activity that if you have anybody at home, you can participate with, with them or you can participate in the q &A. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you all. And I'm gonna pop the Q&A open and the chat. Um, just so I can monitor to see um, as people come on. And um, so here we are, the Community Resiliency Model, or CRIM for short, and we are doing part two. As Manal mentioned, my name is Molly Henricks. I'm a licensed in marriage and family therapist. I work for the San Mateo County Office of Education. My main role there is the coordinator of school safety and risk prevention. However, um, as the token marriage and family therapist, I have also taken on the lead role of um, providing uh, mental health supports uh, across the county, particularly um, due to the impact of the pandemic and um, what that uh, what we've been seeing you know, as a result. About well, actually a little over two years ago, we started to write a grant um, for some school districts. And um, in that grant, we put the community resiliency model as um, an objective that we were going to roll out to all schools that were participating in the grant, all school districts. And luckily we received that grant. And so I've been overseeing that grant, the MHSSA grant. And with that and the exposure that we got um, from getting that grant, we've been fortunate enough to also get funders throughout our county that have said, hey, we recognize that only 12 of the school districts were able to participate in that grant. How about we give <clears throat> some matching funds so 12 of um, the other school districts can um, access the same types of services that the grant has. So this is what's being, um, that we're able to provide the community resiliency model ongoing throughout the county and um, looking at expanding it um, to all staff, teachers, uh, students, and families countywide. So really fortunate that the community resiliency model is going to be something that will be common language throughout San Mateo County. <clears throat> All right, so a little recap about what the community resiliency model is. The community resiliency model is a um, way to help us self-regulate our own emotions and our feelings and help us get back into what we call our resilient zone or our okay zone. And um, the goal is to learn the new the skills that the community resiliency model has, the six different skill sets. And while using those skill sets, what we do is we widen our resilient zone. <clears throat> so as things happen to us throughout the day, we're able to stay within our resilient zone and stay focused on the tasks that we need to have to do at hand throughout the day um, and go on with the activities of daily living that we need to get to. Uh, oftentimes what happens is that stressful events will occur um, and knock us out of our resilient zone, uh, which is fine, but without having the CRIM skills, it's really difficult to get back into our resilient zone. And so the CRIM model helps us when we land up here in that edgy, irritable, or mania, um, maybe angry, um, having anxiety or panic around a situation, that when we stay up there, when we feel stuck and unable to kind of um, get back down and get self-regulated, we can use the skills that we learned a few skills last time and some skills that we'll learn this time to be able to help us get back into our resilient zone. Sometimes though, we do get stuck into our low zone um, or our high zone, but when we get stuck into our low zone, this is where we might start to isolate from one another. 
we might feel sad or depressed, exhausted, or just numb altogether. And it can get very easy to be stuck in this zone and go through our day with not really being able to accomplish the tasks at hand that we need to accomplish, but just barely scraping by. But it's not a situation that we wanna stay in because it's not fully living our best life. And um, kind of the definition of resiliency that the CRIM model holds is that we're able to get through our, our activities of daily living while living fully um, and, and, and having our community and, um, and our, surrounding, our surrounding people embrace us with compassion, but also having self-compassion. And so that's a truncated version of the, of the um, definition. But I just wanted to remind you of kind of why we are um, wanting to make sure that, we're, that we are in our resilient zone and also the definition of what we talk about resilience, what we're talking about. The thing I really like about the community resiliency model is that it's focused on biology. Um, it's really focused on the human nervous system and exactly how the human nervous system uh, works and how we can use our nervous system and use these skills to alter our nervous system or, or our responses to our central nervous system so we can make some small changes that will allow us to get duck back down into that resilient zone um, but also it allows us not to be um, riddled with anxiety or riddled with um, stress and be able to cope a little bit better. We need to embrace the idea that the way our body reacts to stressful situations is human nature, it's biology. We um, can utilize these skills to help kind of shift in the moment, but oftentimes when stressful or traumatic events happen, our body is going to react in a certain way because that's how it's meant to react. Learning these skills can help us um, respond and read our nervous system and return us to our resilience zone, um, but it's, uh, it might not prevent us from actually becoming, uh, you know, utilizing our nervous system and going into our uh, lower part of our brain, which is our survival brain. So again, a recap of the three parts of the brain. We have the survival brain or instinctual part of our brain, our emotional brain, our limbic area, and then our cortex, which is our thinking brain. What's great is when this all works together on a typical day when everything's fine is our survival brain takes care of all the things we don't wanna think about like digesting and breathing and um, our circulation. And then our emotional brain assesses for our risk um, and lets us know how we're feeling and what we think about a certain situation, what we feel about a certain situation. And then our thinking brain allows us to actually have cognition, um, have beliefs, language, and, and speak. So all together, they work really well um, on a typical day. And when something happens to us, like uh, a stressful event or a traumatic event, uh, our survival brain tells the emotional brain and the thinking brain, I've got this, you guys need to sit back. I'm gonna make this human survive. You don't need to do anything. The problem with that is oftentimes what happens is we no longer are able to think. <laughs> um, so our survival brain works on instinct to get us out of a certain situation. And a lot of the behaviors that come along with our survival brain aren't really the behaviors that allow us to function on a day-to-day -day life. So to live in our survival brain doesn't work. Uh, and that's why the CRIM skills help us deal with the stressful situation, get out of our survival brain, and really work in um, living in our thinking brain. So we can look down our brain, look back to our brain and say, we're safe. This is how I feel. And this is how I think. And this is what I, this is the next step I'm going to do. And so we can utilize all three. Um, so with the CRIM skills, we're able to trick our survival brain and um, use cognition to get us back into our thinking part of our brain. Knowing that our survival responses um, can <clears throat> be triggered by a small reminder and it's automatic. It can also be triggered by us perceiving that our environment is threatening, even if um, it may not actually be uh, threatening we perceive it to be that way, and therefore our survival brain acts <clears throat> upon that. And it's instinctual. 
The great thing about the brain is that we have neuroplasticity, which is the ability to learn things and rewire our cell, our brain cells um, throughout our lifetime. So we're able to create our new neurons and connections between the neurons throughout this lifetime, which means that if we practice these community resiliency skills, they can become actually set in how our brain is wired. So if something bad were to happen, a stressful event were to happen, we automatically go to using a CRIM skill because we've practiced it so much that our brain has taken it on as new neurons. Um, so stressful event happens, CRIM skill happens, that they, those are the two neurons that fire together in our brain. So we can train our brain to um, actually rewire itself to think that way versus stressful event happens, we are in completely in our survival brain, we stop thinking and we, um, we are in fight, flight or freeze. So this is the good news and this is why the CRIM skills actually work is because we can rewire ourselves. So, <clears throat> The first skill that we learned last time um, was help now. And help now skills or, re or reset now skills are great in the moment. Um, I've been, I was at, just at a elementary school today teaching um, the faculty and staff about the help now skills. And um, we practiced them in the moment, uh, which was really helpful because what that did was it allowed some of the people that were there in the room who might've been feeling a little bit anxious because they were all in a big room together. Some of them were unmasked, some of them weren't, and that there was some anxiety and utilizing the help now skill helped that faculty and staff be able to kind of those that were a little bit out of their resilient zone because of being all together kind of for the first time actually in a room, um, that they were able to reset their, their resilient zone, reset back down into the resilient zone. So some of the things that are, that are here on this slide that you can see is something like listening to the sounds around you. So what this does is it gives you a moment to stop and pause um, from being in your survival brain, <clears throat> to being stressed out, being in that kind of that high zone or that low zone of your resilience, outside of your resilient zone, to not only pause and listen to the sounds that you hear around you, but then try to identify what those sounds are. So putting some cognition to it, right? So not just listening to the set, listening for the sounds, but identifying those sounds. So if you pause for a second right now and, and took some time to listen to the sounds around you, what might you hear? So for me, I hear the buzzing of my refrigerator. I happen to be at home right now. Um, I hear some cars on the street. And so in a classroom situation or in a playground or um, even in the supermarket, like if you're stressed out, just stopping and listening to the sounds around you and then naming them. Um, what that does is it takes your survival brain and it forces you to actually start to think because you're labeling the sounds that you're hearing. And so it prompts your brain to be forced into the thinking part of your brain. Same with counting backwards from 10 um, or 20, give yourself a challenge or 100, whatever you need. Um, we say 10, there's a little kid on this picture. So a younger student or child might need to start it counting backwards from 10. Um, other things like, um, touching the furniture. So you could do that right now. I mean, you could all kind of take a moment and touch the furniture. Is the furniture near us um, cold? Is it warm? Is it smooth? Is it rough? And if you explore that and you try to label what it feels like and um, notice what it feels like, it one again helps calm that, um, that stressful event or in stressful situation in your survival brain pumps you into your um, front part of your brain, your, your cognitive uh, functioning, your um, cortex, and uh, your thinking part of your brain. And then it helps you um, get into that resilient zone. There's other um, help now skills and really anything that you can do in the moment um, that you find helpful is something that you can do. Are there any questions, please feel free to, to put them into the question and answers and I can get to them as much as I can. 
Um, and, and, you know, we can go from there. So if anything, um, you have clarifying questions or comments, feel free. Um, I want this to be as interactive as a webinar can be. So the next skill that we learned uh, last time was tracking. And this is a skill that you'll notice you're going to use throughout the community resiliency model. You're going to use this um, skill in help now, right? So what tracking is, is noticing or paying attention to what's happening inside your body at the present moment. So if you were to take a moment right now and just notice Maybe do a body scan and just notice how your back feels right now. Is the sensation in your back pleasant or neutral or unpleasant? And the reason why we wanna label whether it's pleasant, neutral or unpleasant is because what we wanna do is we wanna sit or stay in the sensations that are actually pleasant or neutral. Because what's gonna happen is if we sit and in, in we only focus on the unpleasant, this, is, this does not help us get to where we want to be. If we focus on the unpleasant, we're going to stay in our high, on our high um, outside of our resilient zone, our high zone, or we're going to stay in our low zone because it's going to, we're going to, our brain's going to say, oh, this is awful. My back hurts. Something must be wrong with it. I need to go to the chiropractor. I don't have time to go to the chiropractor. I'm too stressed out to go to the chiropractor. I have too much work to do. So we start to, you know, perseverate on what's, you know, wanting to fix it and not being able to. So we're not trying to fix the situation with the community resiliency model. We're just trying to get through the day um, or get through the moment. And that's one thing I really like about it is that we could go to therapy, we could work on our stuff, highly suggest it, um, you know, whatever you need to do to, to kind of get through what you need to get through. But oftentimes what we just need is a quick fix to be able to get through our day or get through dinner or get through a meeting with our boss and, um, or help our students get through, uh, well, so it was spring pictures in my students, in my kids' school. And um, I had a friend who texted me frantically that the dress her daughter wanted to wear wasn't clean and it was the end of the world. And um, you know, the, the whole day was awful. And so I suggested some crim skills because I said, well, you know, you can't fix the fact that the dress isn't clean. She's going to have to pick something else to wear, but what can you do right now to just get her from outside of her resilient zone back in? And so she landed on a couple help now skills to work with her to just get back in there to be able to take a deep breath after doing those and then go to look at the closet and pick something else out really minor, but I think as parents on the call, you can attest to that. Sometimes some of the most minor things like I get, don't get to wear what I want to wear for picture day can lead into a disaster of a day, maybe a disaster of a weekend or a week. And so what we're really trying to do is, is kind of be able to identify what's wrong, use a crim skill to help us get through that situation, and then move on. So being able to experience what's happening in our body and understand if it's pleasant or neutral and focus on that is really important. So asking questions, curiosity questions when tracking and noticing what's going on inside of you, like what do you notice on inside? Are the sensations pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral? Where do you feel the pleasant or neutral sensations? And then if you notice an unpleasant sensation to just move on. So a technique that you can use to kind of um, make us think about tracking is rubbing your hands together really, really fast um, for about 30 seconds and then experiencing what that feels like, right? What type of sensation do you feel in your fingers, in your fingertips, in the palm of your hands, up your forearm, and in your bicep? When I do that, I notice that the sensation inside my fingertips and the palms of my hands tend to be um, pleasant because they're warm. I like the tingly sensation um, and you know it's, it's warm all the way up through my wrists. But what I notice is if I get further down into my biceps that from doing this back and forth so fast and working those biceps, I have a little soreness in there and it's unpleasant. 
Um, so what I do is I shift away from the biceps back to the hands and really pay attention to, to this. And so when you're using tracking in with a help now skill, you might sit there and um, like, say you're gonna go touch something in nature as part of your CREM skill, as your help now. And so when you touch the, maybe the, um, the fawns of a fern and you're feeling them and you're noticing if they're smooth or soft or fuzzy, um, and are they warm to touch? Are they cool to touch? You could also then, when you're touching them, notice how touching that makes you feel inside. So what sensations do you experience on the inside and asking you those, yourself those questions. What that does is it just enhances the experience of the help now skill. So being able to track enhances the help now skills um, if you think about one of the help now skills is taking a sip of water. Well, having that break, having water helps. We know this, it helps with everything, right? But taking a sip of water or iced coffee in my, in what I have right here. And then noticing how that feels going down your throat. What type of sensation you have inside your chest after you take that sip of water or juice? And what do you notice? Is it pleasant? unpleasant, it just enhances the sip of water. A sip of water takes a second, but tracking how that sip of water, um, how you experience it inside your body is what kind of can expand the CRIM skill, um, the help now skill. It also helps us um, with practicing tracking and especially with uh, kids. Practicing tracking, naming it, to figure out ways that we could use different sensation words, right? So schools do a really great job at teaching our kiddos um, feeling words and are you feeling annoyed or angry or um, stressed out or irritated? What type of word would you define as how you're feeling? But what about what you're sensing inside? We often don't use sensation words. And sometimes sensation words can help us describe something a lot better than I feel angry. Because feeling angry, sure, you can feel angry, but what does that mean for you, right? What does feeling angry mean for you? Do you, are you trembling? Um, do you feel your face getting hot? I know for me, when I get angry, I have, my ears get bright red uh, and they start to feel very hot. And so, and then I know, I also, I notice, and I'm conscious of the fact that I know that they do that. So then my face gets hot too, because I'm a little embarrassed. And so I feel flushed and I feel like my, um, my, my face is burning up. I start to feel warm inside my chest. So all of these things are sensation words that are associated with the feeling of anger, um, which is really good to practice using when you're tracking um, and trying to expand those help now skills by asking you know you how um, it's it, how you experience it inside your body. Okay, so that was our recap from last session. Um, and now I want to get into one of these uh, new skills. And I'm not sure if I no, I can't. Okay, I was just thinking about breakout rooms, but that doesn't work, and that's fine. Um, and you might not want that either. So, but again, if you have somebody at home to do this with, highly suggest it. It's a great um, technique and a great skill to use. It's actually how I was introduced to the CRIM model um, back at, two years ago, um, March of 2020. When I was at home with my then six-year-old twin boys, um, working from home, navigating them in first grade on Zoom, which did not work well, um, and trying to do work at home, I was starting to feel really dysregulated. I was out of my resilient zone, um, very stuck in the high, irritable, angry, um, super emotional. And I was having a meeting with my boss and she pointed out that I seemed very much out of my resilient zone. Didn't use that terminology at the time because I didn't know what that meant yet. But 
said, you know, you seem really stressed out. I want to be able to help you. I know I can't fix the situation, but could you do me a favor and go somewhere private in your house just for five minutes? And so I found a bedroom. I could like go with the computer on Zoom with my boss. And she said, get your cell phone out. And I want you to go through this technique with me. And it was resourcing. And what the technique was, what she had me go through is, and I, this is what I want you guys to go through in a minute, is she said, okay, I want you to look at your phone. I want you to go to the pictures in your phone. And you could all do this with me actually right now if you want. So go into the pictures of your phone. And I want you to look for a picture of something that brings you joy. Something that lifts you up, that makes you incredibly happy. Um, whether it's a picture of a vacation you took, uh, maybe it's a picture of the beach from your walk you just did the other day. Maybe it's a picture of your children. Um, oftentimes, I've, when I've done this, I've found that it, it tends to be a picture of your pet. Um, you know, maybe it's a picture of your spouse. Good on you if it's a picture of your spouse. Um, but maybe it's the backyard tree that you love so much. Whatever it is, I want you to pull up that picture. I'll give you guys a, a minute to get to it while I find one. Okay, so you all have the picture. What I'd like you to do, and I'll share my picture with you all. Um, my picture I have, I don't know if you can see it. Oh, you can't really see it because of my blur. But imagine the Grand Canyon, the classic pic picture from the top of one of the trails of the Grand Canyon. I recently hiked the Grand Canyon. So the memory of that brings me joy, brings me happiness, sense of accomplishment, and it's just a stunning, uh, huge, vast area of land that is very beautiful. Um, and it was snowing at the time, so it's got, um, there's snow on the ground, and it just makes for a very beautiful uh, picture and landscape. So um, I'd like you to grab your photo and look at it. And if you're with somebody, I'd like you to answer these questions. And if you're not to them, right, to have the conversation with them. And if you're not with somebody, feel free to put it in the question and answers or put it um, or just kind of listen to what I'm saying and answer me as if I'm, I'm in the room with you. But what is, your, what is that a picture of? Describe to me what your picture is. So I'm going to describe to you. So my picture is of the Grand Canyon. Um, and it was a picture I took as I was hiking back up when it started to snow. And so there's snow on um, a bunch of cacti on the side of the uh, a hillside or side of the, cl the cliff and, the, um, and on the plateaus as you look out throughout the whole canyon and um, you look into the, the canyon, into the valley, there's no snow below, but there's a dusting of snow on the very top of everything. Okay, when, when you look at that picture, um, what was that day like for you when you looked at that, when, when you were there? And so for me, it was a really um, stressful day. It was really tiring, but in the end, it, um, it lifted me up to know that I completed it. You might be looking at a picture of your dog. So what's your dog's name? What do you like to do with your dog? What's the funniest thing your dog does? So these types of words or sentences that, you're, that I'm asking you is what helps you solidify what your resource is. So if you're doing this with a, uh, your child, what I did was I actually had my children take um, some pictures from a magazine and you know what, what do they love? What do you love? What's a thing, a memory, part of yourself, something internal or external that you really like. And so we picked out some ideas. They picked out, you know, pictures of the beach, pictures of dogs, 
Um, I think they picked out like Pokemon cards from the magazine. So they picked, they cut out a bunch of different things and they made a collage. And that collage in the pandemic was what helped us map out and, and to have in their rooms where they could go to and I could ask them about their resource. So if they couldn't think of it right away. So when you're resourcing, you can do it yourself by looking at a picture on your phone or thinking about it and then using tracking to track how you feel on the inside. If you're with somebody, you can ask that person, like if you're trying to help your child, you can ask that person what your resource is. Name your resource for them. What's something that brings you joy? And so when I did this with my, before we made the collages, um, I did this with my child right after actually my boss did it with me. And so when my boss did it with me, she asked, you know, what's your, what's something that brings you joy? And I, and she was like, please don't pick your children because right now they're not bringing you joy because you're stuck in the house with them in the pandemic and it was stressful. So I picked my dog and I got a picture of my dog at the beach and she was like, okay, tell me about your dog. What's the dog's name? I told her about the dog. And at the beach, what does your dog do when it first gets to the beach? What's your dog, how does the dog respond to the ocean? How does your dog respond to the sand? And just asking me questions about my dog. And through, while she was asking me questions about my dog, what do you think happened to me crying and being emotional and being so stressed out and being frustrated and, and really outside of my resilience zone? Well, I literally, while talking about my dog, went and just went directly into my resilience zone um, because I started to calm down. I started to feel better because I was talking about something that makes me feel good. And that's what resourcing can do. You can either think about it and then notice how you're feeling, right? So tracking yourself, or you can work with somebody else and asking them what makes you feel better. So when I asked my son before he even knew what resourcing was, I, I helped them along. And this is something that you can do with your kids is you can kind of help them along with it, right? depending on the age, right? This, my son was six at the time, asking him, you know, what may, what's a, a person, place, or thing, or part of yourself that makes you feel calm, pleasant, peaceful, strong, or resilient. He didn't really know those words yet. But what I asked, I knew that he had fun on a camping trip we went on. And I said, what was your favorite part about our camping trip? And so he was able to articulate what the favorite part was, fishing on the dock. And I said, okay, when you were fishing on the dock, how did, what did you notice? How did it feel? Um, what type of sensation did you have? And so he was able to note it, to, to articulate that. He said, what I noticed was how warm the sun was on my, on my skin. Okay, and was that, that pleasant or neutral? And so I started to have a conversation with him, which then intensified the resource. Um, so in the intensifying of the resource, which is just what my boss did with me when I was looking at the picture of my dog, talking to me about um, what, what I liked about that, that my dog. I was talking to him about what did you like about that camping trip? So what are some of the things that um, when you were on the dock fishing that, um, what, what were some of the smells that you noticed? Oh, the, the smell of the lake and the pine trees. And so he was able to remember the smell. He was able to remember, we didn't have any dead fish, so it didn't smell bad. Um, but he was able to remember the smell and he was able to remember what it felt like for the sun to be on him and for the breeze to be um, kind of going through, you know, past his body. And he was able to talk about that. And what that did was it helped to kind of calm him down. He was super upset um, because I told him no, that he couldn't have more candy. Um, something simple that we do as parents all the time that our kids respond to and react to. And it's not like we're gonna give in, right? Just because they have a temper tantrum and they get upset that we say no, but we also don't want them to spiral into ruining the day. Um, and oftentimes it might be like when we're trying to leave the house or we're trying to do something. So utilizing the resource in the moment and saying, okay, I know you're upset about the candy, but can you tell me something that you enjoyed that you did last weekend? And then just, and then asking questions about that to intensify the resource. One of the ways that you can use resourcing is through um, conversational resourcing or resiliency pauses. So when you know your child is telling you 
about a stressful situation or an adult or anybody that's sharing with you uh, a story where they're telling you um, lots, right? And they think they have to tell you every detail, but every detail might be really upsetting or it might bump them out of their resilient zone. You can, um, you know, you can engage with that person and have them tell part of the story, but ask them, gently ask them questions about the resiliency elements of the story. So if they're telling you about something bad that happened at school, they can say, um, who did you notice was standing next to you when that happened? Oh, well, my friend was next to me. Oh, and what friend is that? So talking about maybe they had somebody, maybe something you know unsettling happened at school, but they were surrounded by their friends and that made, made it a little bit better. Um, also, you know, thinking about like the, the camping trip, right? So if I were to ask him to tell me all the stories about the camping trip, he would have also said that um, it was so cold the night we were there that we went through all of our wood in one night and he was freezing and we, we barely slept because it was so cold. And then he would have said, he could have told you that um, he woke up to everything being soaking wet outside because it rained and the raccoons ransacked our whole campground. So all of our food was gone because I forgot to put it in the cook. So he could have said all of that if I let him, but by shifting it and talking about what was the part of the camping trip that you enjoyed, right? You just shift them away from the, maybe the element that might be unsettling and shift them into talking about the resiliency elements. Um, also, you know, you need to remember that this model, right, we're not using it as a form of therapy. So we're not asking you to sit with your child and, and do a therapy session with them um, by using resiliency pauses and resourcing, but really just getting through a situation and moving on. Again, it's an it's a in the moment um, type of uh, tool. So some more examples, right, about conversational resourcing is one way to integrate re resiliency pauses. So if you wanna tell me the story, I'll ask you from time to time to pause. So the story doesn't become over overwhelming. Is that okay with you? So just asking them ahead of time and then doing that. So, hey, I'm gonna pause right now and I wanna make sure that um, I wanna ask when you were in that moment, what was something positive that was happening? And then that's embedding the resiliency, right? Um, that way it's not somebody kind of dumping all the bad stuff on you, but really taking it from a resiliency lens and having them explain it to you while maybe pulling out some of the resources, things that bring them joy in the moment as well. So they don't get bumped out of the resilient zone when they're telling you a hard situation or a hard story. So here's three different ways that you can use conversational resourcing. Um, in a situation that might be unsettling. So after a crisis, um, so a crisis situation occurs, maybe um, you're processing that, you can utilize it by having the person you know, tell the story, but again, taking those pauses and asking them about um, parts of the story that might be positive. So when I think about this, I think about maybe, um, you know, we're, I did a lot of work <clears throat> a couple of years ago with victims of the fires up north and asking them about like, you know, them wanting to process the crisis and talk about what had happened. But then, you know, when they started to get upset about their house, I was like, I just wanna pause for a second. I just wanna, can you tell me about what the garden in your house looked like, you know, your property looked like? And having them tell you something that's happy about the situation or about um, the thing that they're, they're most upset about can help um, in uh, pulling into that, pulling that resiliency into the conversation. Also conversational resourcing after a loss. So a loss of a loved one and having somebody or a child talk to you about how they feel about um, that loss. And then pulling in like um, funny stories about that person that maybe you lost. Um, what was your favorite memory of that person? Oh yeah, do you remember what they were wearing that day? Oh, that was, yeah, they always used to like to wear that sweater. Do you remember the smell of the, the person that you're talking about? And so just asking the questions about utilizing that person because that person typically brought them joy if they're processing a loss 
and just asking them some of the positives about that, things that make them feel pleasant, right, or neutral, so they stay in their resilient zone. And then lastly, when conversational resourcing, when challenged by a questionable resource, right? So when I was doing this with um, certain groups of people, and you know, one group that really enjoyed this was law enforcement. And when I was um, talking to law enforcement about this, one of the things that uh, comes up frequently is, what's your resource? And one of the, you know, and, and somebody would say, oh, well, like drinking, drinking is my resource. That's what makes me feel happy. That's what makes me feel better. Okay, that can be a response and it can be completely valid, right? We, oftentimes people might have a glass of wine to unwind or whatever. That could be maybe questionable too, as to like, well, you know, you get that judgment, like how much, all that. So one of the things that you could do when talking to a friend or talking to your teenager about this, maybe if they say, well, you know, vaping is my resource um, and you're like, mm, or like excessive amounts of video games are my resource. And you're like, that's a little questionable, but okay. So this was a law enforcement officer. Okay. So when you drink Jack Daniels, where do you drink Jack Daniels typically? Oh, well, we go, you know, I typically go to the bar after work um, and have a few and then I'll head home. Okay, well, do you go to the bar with anybody? Yeah, I go with so and so and so and so, and then you know, I know the bartender. Okay, when you sit down at the bar, what do you do with those people? Oh, well, we sit down and we have a drink and we talk. Oh, really? You guys talk? What do you talk about? And then all of a sudden, you're focusing on talking about um, the actual uh, the interaction that's happening, even though they've said their resource is Jack Daniels. But really, what you're pulling at is it's probably not the Jack Daniels that's your resource. It's what you're doing while you're drinking the Jack Daniels, right? So talking to your friends, what do you talk about? Oh, well, we talk about our shift. We talk about our children, all of that. And that helps us feel better. So there's kind of using conversational resourcing to get the person away from Jack Daniels is my resource or video gaming is my resource um, for hours on end to being able to communicate with my friends online in a, you know, while playing a game that I really like is my resource. So it's, it's that being able to be connected with another human being, even if it's over a headset or a video game. Um, so a way to take a, maybe a questionable resource and make it into something more positive. Um, and that's, you know, utilizing conversational resources. All right, so because this is a webinar, it didn't take as long, um, but I wanna pause here and just um, ask if there's any questions that wanna get put into the chat. Next time we're gonna go over the, the um, last few um, community resiliency model skills. Um, the ones that we have left is grounding techniques. So we're gonna actually do a grounding technique and um, gesturing. Uh, and spontaneous movements. And then the last is just a shift and stay. And shift and stay is really the community resiliency model skill that is like the 2.0 version. So it's how to get through a full day by continually using CRIM skills to get you through the day. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing right now so you can see me a little bit better um, and see if there's any questions in the chat um, or anything like that, or any questions and answers somebody might have. Um, there is one, let's see. How do you help somebody go into resiliency zone when they're in an irrational or over-emotional state? Yeah, so one of the things that I um, train on and, and I tell people is that one of the things that's best is to try to use the CRIM skills when they're not in that right, or irrational or over emotional state. So for right now, if they're calm, let's start to practice the community resilience model skills now. So when they are in that kind of irrational or overly emotional state, we can go to them and say, okay, remember that, um, you know, remember your crim skills? Can you help that? So overly emotional state, my kid crying over not having more candy, I could say that may be overly emotional. It might not be completely irrational, but you know, 
prompting him to say if he knew his crim skills by then, hey, I need you to go, you know, like use a crim skill. Luckily, he knew some like breathing techniques so we could get that to get him down. But really learning the crim skills before you need them is what's most helpful. So when you are in, uh, in that heightened state, um, you can say, hey, remember the crim skills that we talked about? I really want to be able to talk to you about what's going on right now and what you need from me. But I'm wondering if we could do some help now skills. The help now skills are those instant ones that really help you get back into maybe further down, maybe not all the way into your resilience zone, but a little bit further um, towards your resiliency zone. So maybe you could do resourcing um, to help you get all the way back. Um, the recordings of last session and today are going to be posted on the PTO website, um, I believe, or on the district website. And um, I believe, and Manal can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I, um, I think they're going to be posted. I know by tomorrow this, will, this recording will be posted. Are these techniques for short term? What techniques would be long term? Well, this is in the moment. So you can utilize this for your whole life. Um, so long term, yes, you can utilize this long term. Um, they are in the moment, though, right? So using it right now, maybe if something stresses you out, tomorrow if something stresses you out, and throughout your life when something stresses you out. But if there's some deep-seated trauma, if there's relational, relational issues that are happening to make you more stressed out, wanting to engage in some other type of help. So whether it's um, therapy, whether it's uh, you know, some type of movement, exercise, yoga, mindfulness, and we're gonna get to grounding techniques and grounding techniques are like a short-term version of mindfulness, right? So that's something that can be utilized um, as long-term, but these can be used long-term, they're just in the moment. Um, and so the idea is to get, and again, remember the neuroplasticity, right, of your brain, is to be able to move from having to think about utilizing CRIM skills and remember to use them to it being second nature, right? That when you feel stressed out, your body automatically goes to do a CRIM skill because your brain cells, your neurons have talked to each other so much that stressed out moment, crim skill, stressed out moment, crim skill. And it learns how that that's what you do. And so when a stressed out moment occurs later, it'll automatically do the crim skill because that's how your brain cells have, have rewired themselves. And so that's kind of more of the long-term technique is to rewire your brain cells, but you need to practice ongoing all the crim skills. Um, what are signs that a child's trauma or anxiety needs therapy? That's a very large question. Um, and I would definitely consult with their primary care caregiver. I would definitely consult with the counselor at school um, or the wellness folks at school, depending on what school the, the child's at. Um, I would also, if it's getting in the way of being able to complete um, daily living and crim skills aren't working, and it's getting in the way of their absolute happiness on an ongoing basis, um, I would go ahead and try therapy. I don't, I also don't believe in waiting until it gets so bad to try therapy. Oftentimes, sometimes what we need as humans is the ability just to talk or process a few things with people um, that are one, gonna listen, are gonna meet us with compassion and empathy and two, maybe give us a few skills that we can then utilize. So if um, you feel that a child has trauma and has anxiety, short-term therapy can even work. Like try six sessions, see what happens, see if it helps. If not, if it doesn't help and nothing changes, then um, try something different. If it starts to help in six sessions, give it another six. Um, see what comes out of it. Uh, again, you know, as a therapist, I'm gonna say therapy is great. I'm also gonna say that sometimes trauma can't be talked away, especially with kids, but it can be kind of felt away. So if you, you know, again, utilizing tracking, 
um, understanding how things are processed in your body and then um, trying to track it away, right? Think it away. Um, utilizing CRIM skills to um, identify how you experience that feeling inside of you, what the sensations are, labeling them, and just knowing about them. It can help then also maybe you need to process it, right? And, and do some more deeper work, but you need to be able to have some resiliency before being able to do that deeper work. So that's where the CRIM skills can come in first. All right, I think that those are all the answers or all the questions um, that I see in the chat. I will stay on for a few more minutes um, if anybody wants to, is, is typing. But for right now, I want to say thank you for giving me an hour of your time. Looking forward to next month where we're going to wrap up our three-part series. And again, I'll be able to give you the, um, a power, the PowerPoint afterwards. So you have kind of the full PowerPoint of all three um, sessions. And you can look back and be able to utilize some of these um, in your own work, whether it's at your office um, or your work with your own children. So again, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us and I will see you next month. Hey, Molly, I, I think you're muted, actually. Ah, oh, oh my God, I was saying such amazing things. Oh my, okay. Um, where was I muted? Okay, so Ky, uh, Kylie, I don't know. And I will look it up and get back to you all. Um, and uh, around that um, and how I feel like it aligns with um, CRIM model. How to help children with identified feelings. Um, really needing to give them the words um, and actually the feeling words and have it associated with how their face might look in the moment. So, um, you know, a frustrated face like, mm, mm, or an angry face, like taking pictures of yourself, making those faces, taking pictures of other family members so they can look at the, the pictures and identify that. I feel like dad today, dad has a frustrated look on his face. I feel like mom, mom has a sad face, Wh whoever. Um, this school I was at today had all the staff take pictures of their face and um, put it on a chart. And it helped um, kids kind of monitor their moods by being able to say, that's the mood I'm in, that's the mood I'm in. But there's also ones online you can just download. Like um, uh, emojis on your phone work really well too. Having your kids pick out what that looks like, depending on how old they are. But um, looking at what that, you know, what is, um, what does that uh, emoji, what do you think that emoji is feeling right now? What do you think that emoji is feeling? And then making a, a chart with those emojis can be helpful as well. Mind body parenting. Okay, I'll look it up. Thank you very much. All right, well, that is our time. I appreciate you all. Um, I will see you next time. Have a great rest of your night. And remember, practice those CRIM skills because uh, that's what makes them actually uh, work is and become second nature to us. All right. Thanks so much. Take care.